So now that we know what a signal transduction pathway is, let's actually take a look at an example that takes place inside our body. So in this lecture, we're going to focus on epinephrine signaling, the epinephrine signal transduction pathway. But before we actually get to that, let's discuss an important category of transmembrane proteins that are used as receptors by these signal transduction pathways. And these are known as the seven transmembrane helix receptors or simply 7TM receptors. Now the structure of these receptors basically consists of seven membrane spanning alpha helices as shown in this particular diagram. So this is our phospholipid bilayer membrane. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these membrane spanning alpha helices. And notice they span the membrane in a snake-like fashion. And that's why sometimes we call these seven transmembrane helix receptors helix receptors, we also call them serpentine receptors. Now, this is the outside, this is the inside of our cell, and any time a, a primary messenger wants to bind onto the structure, it binds on the outside portion, the extracellular side of this 7TM receptor. And so, right here, we have an internal cavity that can fit that primary messenger. So, the primary messenger could be a neurotransmitter, it could be a hormone, as we'll see in this particular case, it can even be a synthetic drug, that we, that, that we create in the laboratory to basically inhibit the activity of the signal transduction pathway. In, the, in either case, it always binds onto the extracellular side of that receptor and it doesn't actually move into the cytoplasm of that cell. Now, in many cases, so it's not shown in this diagram, but it's shown in this diagram, and, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. In many cases, the 7TM domain actually contains additional protein domains attached onto the intracellular side of that structure, as we see in this particular case. And those additional structures play very important, very specific roles. So, now let's move on to the epinephrine signaling pathway. So in the epinephrine signal transduction pathway, the epinephrine is that primary messenger and it binds onto a special region of a protein we call the beta adrenergic receptor, the beta AR, which is a type of 7TM receptor. So this is what it looks like. So we have the membrane, we have the outside, the inside, this is the epinephrine shown in red. And instead of drawing out this complex structure, we're going to represent this complex structure with this green structure here. So this is the 7TM domain. And this pocket is the pocket shown here to which the epinephrine actually binds to. Now, let's take a look at the structure of the beta adrenergic receptor. Now, before the epinephrine actually binds to this section here, this is what it looks like. So notice, on the intracellular side, we have a heterotrimer structure. And what that means is, we have three different domains that create a trimer attached onto this 7TM domain on the inside portion of that structure. So we have an alpha domain, a beta domain, and a gamma domain. Now the alpha domain is actually a G protein itself and what that means is it binds guanyl nucleotides such as GDP and GTP. Now before the epinephrine actually binds, the alpha domain contains a, GD, uh, a GDP, a guanosine diphosphate. And when the guanosine diphosphate is bound to that alpha domain, the alpha domain has a very high affinity for the 7TM domain and these other two domains. And that's why we have this structure shown here. The alpha domain is bound to these two domains as well as to that 7TM domain. So when epinephrine is not bound to the beta adrenergic receptor, beta AR, the G protein binds guanosine diphosphate, G DP, and this keeps that trimeric domain intact and attached onto that 7TM domain as we see in this diagram. But 
What happens when the epinephrine actually binds onto this location here? Well, as soon as that epinephrine binds, it creates conformational changes in this region of that 7TM domain. And that also creates conformational changes in the alpha domain. So essentially what happens is there is a constriction in the region that holds the GDP and that expels that GDP. And instead of having the GDP, there is a soluble GTP in solution inside the cytoplasm and goes on and binds onto a new location found in that alpha domain. And as soon as that alpha domain, the G-alpha protein, so this is also known as the G-alpha protein because the alpha domain is a G-protein. So as soon as that G-alpha domain binds the GTP, it loses its affinity not only for this 7TM membrane protein, it also loses affinity for this dimer structure here that consists of this beta in orange and the gamma in purple. And so what happens is there is a dissociation process that takes place. And this GTP, that is, or this uh, GTP carrying structure essentially dissociates from not only the green structure, but also from this dimer structure we call the G beta gamma structure or the B, uh, the G beta uh, gamma dimer. So upon binding, the epinephrine induces conformational changes in the 7TM that stimulates the G protein, the alpha region to release the GDP and bind the GTP, guanosine triphosphate. This also causes the beta gamma or the G beta gamma dimer to dissociate from that G alpha protein as shown in this diagram. Now, this simply dissociates away. But what happens to this GTP structure? Well, before we examine that, let's mention the following important points. So, this is the first stage where we have amplification taking place. And so this is the first level of amplification. But how is amplification actually achieved in this stage? Well, a single epinephrine molecule, when it binds to this single structure, it not only induces the change of this G protein, it also induces the change of many other G proteins found in close proximity. And so not only this, will this alpha domain lose the GDP and bind the GTP, but also nearby alpha domains on other structures, on other 7TM domains will also expel that GDP and bind the GTP. So a single epinephrine can cause many G proteins to exchange the GTP for the GDP. And this causes an amplification effect. This is the first level of amplification. The second level we'll discuss in just a moment. So once this takes place, once the epinephrine binds onto its side, it causes a conformational change that allows this structure to expel that GDP and instead of that, basically bind the GTP and that decreases the affinity of this G alpha protein to this structure and this dimer and so they dissociate. Now this structure basically goes on and binds onto another transmembrane protein, an enzyme found in the membrane known as adenylate cyclase, which is shown here. So the adenylate cyclase basically contains 12 membrane spanning alpha helices found in that membrane. And then we also have two domains found on the intracellular side. And that GTP carrying G alpha protein goes on and binds onto this intracellular domain of the adenylate cyclase. And it stimulates this enzyme to basically carry out its function to transform ATP molecules into the secondary messenger molecules we call cyclic adenosine monophosphates or simply CAMP. 
So the dissociated G alpha domain in the GTP state moves and binds to another transmembrane protein, an enzyme to be specific, called adenylate cyclase. It stimulates the adenylate cyclase to begin transforming the ATP into the cyclic AMP. And, this, and these cyclic AMP molecules are what we call secondary messenger molecules. And that's because these secondary messenger molecules are intramolecular molecules found inside the cells that can diffuse into different regions and organelles found within that cell. And they can basically induce and stimulate many different types of processes as we'll see in just a moment. Now, this is the second level of amplification. So this was the first and this is the second. Why? Well, because a single G alpha protein goes on and binds to a single adenylate cyclase and then that single cyclase enzyme carries out many individual processes in which it produces many of these cyclic AMP molecules. So we have a ton of this, these cyclic AMP molecules that then can diffuse into different regions in the cell. Now, what exactly is the function of CAMP? Well, CAMP can go on and basically stimulate many effector molecules and effectors can be enzymes or proteins or transcription factors, but Inside our body, the most important job of CAMP in this particular case in the epinephrine signal transduction pathway is the fact that the cyclic AMP goes on and stimulates and activates protein kinase A molecules. Now, recall from our previous discussion on protein kinase A, or simply PKA, the structure of protein kinase A consists of two types of domains. So we have two regulatory domains and we have two catalytic domains. And in its inactive form, all these domains interact to form this tetramer structure. But when CAMP molecules go, uh, go on and bind to the protein kinase A, they bind to the regulatory sites of the regulatory structures and that causes the dissociation of the catalytic sites. And what that does is it opens up the active sites of the catalytic regions and those catalytic regions are what we call the activated PKA. And now the activated PKA can go on to carry out its function. So what is its function? Well, basically the active PKA goes on and phosphorylates specific amino acids such as threonine on proteins and enzymes. And what that does is it activates those molecules. So, two important things that PKA does is the following. Number one, PKA basically activates enzymes which are responsible for breaking down glycogen into glucose. And then our cells can use the glucose to basically form ATP molecules. And for instance, if we're discussing muscle cells, if this is the membrane of a muscle cell, the ATP can then be used to contract that muscle. Another important function of PKA, among its many, many functions, is to activate special transcription factors that can basically go on, move into the nucleus of that cell and activate gene expression and that can produce many important enzymes and proteins that must be used by that cell to carry out some type of physiological effect. Now, the next thing I'd like to focus on is how to actually terminate this specific epinephrine signal transduction pathway, and that we'll focus on in the next lecture.